Hey, uh, it's Nathan, and today I want to tell you about sets, or I want to, to try to tell you about uh, sets. Um, this is the second video in the series of videos, so if you haven't seen the first one, that might be helpful, uh, but this is a little bit different than what I did in the first video. Um, so, what's a set? I just have to caveat this for people, is that I'm not going to give the set axioms, because I'm not doing rigorous set theory in this video. I'm doing the naive set theory that you learn when you first are introduced to the idea of what sets are and um, what you use when you prove most things uh, when you're doing math outside of set theory and logic and model theory and all of those other things that are very concerned with foundational mathematics. Uh, so I'm not doing that. I'm doing the naive thing, because uh, that is the context in which m makes most sense for this series of videos. So first off, a set is a collection of objects. And so then once we have our collection of objects, we say that an, uh, an element of a set is just something that is in the set. So if X is in the set A, then we say that X is an element of A, and we use this notation. It's just X, and then there's this stylized epsilon, which means in or within, um, and then you have the set that you're in. So the empty set, which is deno uh, denoted by uh, a null, or just like a zero with a cross through it, uh, is the set with no elements. Singleton X is the name of the set that just contains x. And then the last thing that goes into this naive idea of what a set is, is that, well, a set is by definition finite. If it can be matched up exactly from the elements of natural numbers from one to some n, where n is a positive integer. And so that's, that's great, right? So we have this naive notion of what a set is and what sets look like in a naive way. Uh, but you probably want to start writing some things down, right? And being able to work with these things and making your own examples. To do that, uh, you might go ahead and say, well, oh, if I just want all of the things that satisfy a particular property. And that isn't the way to go. That fails. And so the way to see this is to think about the problem with the following collection. So let S be the set of sets such that those sets are not elements of themselves. And so the first exercise for this video is, is S in itself or not? If you were to go down this road further, it gets you to like definitions of what a proper class is and all of that stuff, but we're not doing that in these videos. So instead, at least in naive set theory, what we do is we write down the following type of thing, where you're a set if your members come from some set and they fit a particular property, which should feel bad. If you want to do math and you want to do math rigorously, this should feel like not a great definition of how you, or not a great construction of how you build sets. Because uh, essentially I'm telling you that if you want to write down a set, you write down as something in terms of another set, but you don't know that the how to write down the other thing. Uh, rigorously, right? So you get into this sort of cycle of logical issues uh, with the naive set theory. However, this is how we introduce it to people because it's easier to grasp and it's more intuitive and it allows us to do most of the things that we want to do. Uh, so uh, outside of, again, like foundations and set theory and logic and model theory and etc. Um, that people care about. So this is the context in which I will live in these videos. And in most of my videos, this is the context in which I live. So same as with when we did propositions in the last video, now that we have an idea of what sets are, I should tell you how to do things with sets. And so here are some set basics. So two sets, A and B are equal, A is equal to B when they have the same elements. We write A is not equal to B if in fact A and B are not equal. Uh, this can be written symbolically in the following way. So A is equal to B if and only if for all X, X is within A if and only if X is within B. If instead each element of A is an element of B, we write A is contained in B or A is a subset of B and A is called a subset in this case. 
Further, if A is a subset of B and A does not equal B, we may write that A is strictly a subset of B, and we call A a proper subset of B. So some examples with this, first off, sets don't contain any other information beside what is in them. So the way and order in which you write down elements does not change the set. So for example, the set 1, 2 is the same set as 2, 1. Another example that comes up a lot is just containment of different numbers. Uh, so the natural numbers are contained in the integers, which are contained in the rationals, which are contained in the reals, which are contained in the complex numbers. Another natural question to ask, and this will be the next exercise, is well, how many subsets are there of a finite set? So uh, if you have n elements in a set, how many subsets do you have? Another thing I should mention before moving on to the next part of this set basic stuff is that if you have a set where you have duplicated elements, duplication isn't a thing with sets. We're not talking about what are called multi-sets here. We're just talking about normal sets. So we can't have uh, multiples of the same element in the set. Or, or if we do, it just, they reduce down is the better way to say that. That is, if you have a set containing the element one twice, that is just the same thing as the set containing the element one. Let's get to some set operations. So given two sets A and B, the union of A and B, written A cup B, is given by all of the x's such that x is within A or x is within B. The intersection of A and B is written A cap B. A intersect B is by definition equal to all of the x's such that x is within A and x is within B. In particular, and something that's important for thinking about things and working with sets in more convoluted contexts is that a lot of times we want our sets to not intersect. So we have a name for this. And so when two sets intersect to give the empty set, we call those sets disjoint. And it means exactly what you want it to mean visually, is that if you were to draw these sets in a Venn diagram notation, is that they would be separated by some abstract space. And then we have set difference. So the set difference A minus B is by definition equal to the set of all X's such that X is within A and X is not within B. So it's just taking away anything that might be shared between A and B from A. So a special set difference is that of the complement of a set within another set. So if you have A, a subset of X, where you think about X is like your, the universe in which you're working in, uh, then A complement is going to be equal to all of the X's that were not in A. And that's the same thing as the set difference of X minus A. And then lastly, we have this thing called the symmetric difference, uh, which is written in the following way, and it's by definition equal to the set difference A minus B union the set difference B minus A. So you're just making sure whatever elements that you have in the symmetric difference, they are exclusively in one of your sets. And so this is like a, in some way you can think about the symmetric difference as sort of a disjointifying operator in some way, but it's not exactly that. So now you have some basics about just set operations. Another thing that I should bring up and that's important uh, when talking about things that live in sets is different quantifiers. So a lot of times when you have statements or propositions or just arguments to make, you need there to exist something or you need for all things in a particular set for something to happen. And these are quantified statements because we're quantifying how much of a set is doing a particular thing in some sense. So for example, if you have the statement, if T is a triangle in the Euclidean plane, then the sum of the interior angles of T is 180, then this is a statement about all triangles in the Euclidean plane. And this is what is meant by a universal quantifier. So a universal quantifier is a statement of the form for all X, P holds at X. And this is written as this upside down A, X of P of X. So an existence quantifier, by contrast, is a statement of the form, there exists an X such that P of X holds, written as backwards capital E, X parentheses P of X. So for example, we can take that triangle statement and convert it into a universal quantified statement uh, in that for all T in the Euclidean plane, the property holds. Alternatively, we can look at, for some existence thing, we can say that x squared is less than x for some x within r times i, 
where r times i is just the set of all real numbers times the square root of negative one. And we can rewrite that statement as there exists an x within ri such that x squared is less than zero. For quantified statements, negation becomes a little bit more nuanced than it usually is for normal logical statements. So when you negate a universal quantifier, so for example, for all x, p of x, and you go ahead and apply negation to it, what happens to the universal quantifier is that it becomes an existence quantifier, and then you also negate the statement or the predicate uh, that is used after the quantifier. So for all x, p of x negates to there exists an x such that not p of x holds. Similarly, if you have an existence quantifier, so there exists x such that q holds at x, and you go ahead and negate that, you're going to go ahead and switch the existence quantifier to a universal one and then negate the predicated statement. So by negation, that would become for all x, not q holds at x. So to explain that a little bit more, if you're negating that everything works out, then all you need to do is find one thing where stuff doesn't work out, because that tells you that not everything worked out. And similarly, in the existence case, if you want to negate that there exists a thing where something happens, you just need to show that for all of the things, that particular thing doesn't happen. Another way to say that is that the opposite of a there exists statement is that nothing exists for which that statement holds. So that's basically it for today. But in this video, I already put some exercises throughout the middle of this video, but I also wanted to talk about the ones that I put at the end of the video here. So um, just briefly, the third exercise is to show that two sets are equal if and only if they are subsets of each other. Uh, this exercise, although it is, is fairly quick, uh, it's really important because it validates that when we'll do element chasing proofs later on. So I think the next video I'll start talking about proof methods. Uh, when you do element chasing proofs to show that sets are equal, um, this exercise will validates that those proofs are actually valid arguments. The next one is an analogy to De Morgan's laws for propositional logic. There's a De Morgan's laws for sets. Uh, so if, uh, I already talked about this one in a short, which I'll put up here. And then lastly, there are some more like complicated negation things. That's it. I'll leave, uh, I'll put the exercises back up on screen after I do my little blah, blah, blah. Yeah, if you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more math stuff. I also talk about how PhD things are going uh, as well on this channel. So if you're interested in how I'm doing as a person, that's there. Uh, but yeah, as always, I am Nathan, this is Chalk, and I will see you next time.